Hello viewers, I'm SB and welcome to Crusader Kings 3, a deep strategy game of dynasties and intrigue that I do not know how to play. Here's the deal with this. I have been meaning to do Crusader Kings videos for years at this point, since well before there even was a third game. Um, but Crusader Kings is pretty complicated and it's kind of not a game in the classical sense in that there are no victory conditions. It's a very self-directed experience. You sort of have to determine what you're going to try to accomplish. Um, so I figured in order to make good content about this, probably I should learn to play it off camera, right? So that I can come up with some cool ideas for series. Um, and, then I, and then I didn't do that and I kept not doing it for a very long time. Uh, so here's what I've decided. I wanna actually get into this. I think it's well past time. And if I don't do it on camera, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to maintain the discipline to, <laughs> to actually figure it out. So, y'all are going to come with me on a little journey of discovery here as we learn about Crusader Kings 3. I solicited some ideas in the subreddit for like what would be good uh, campaigns for learning the game, and more than one person recommended Petty King Merchad, a ruler in Ireland. And then when I started up the game, it also said that that was a good idea. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to just play this tutorial and figure out what on earth is Crusader Kings 3, and why does everybody love it so much? Now, I will say, one thing that's probably going to be a little bit of a stumbling block for me is that I do not really have very good knowledge of history. Um, so there's probably going to be some terminology here and there that's going to... I might have to Google some things, so please bear with me in that case. Welcome to Crusader Kings 3, where you are a medieval ruler. Your reign may be brief, but through your heirs you can bring your dynasty to prom prominence. Land is yours for the taking, by way of the sword or through marriage, and clever diplomacy can extend your reach far beyond the wildest dreams of any conqueror. There is no one way to win in Crusader Kings 3, a truly terrifying sentence. It's more about the interesting roleplay opportunities that are afforded by the system than it is about, like, trying to win, right? So we have some camera basics. It does this stuff. It has edge pan. Pressing home takes you back to your capital. Good information. Uh, different information is displayed at the different zoom levels. Okay. That's I, I kind of dig this. <laughs> it's goofy, but I kind of dig the fact that the maximum zoom level is a paper map on a wooden table. All right, and then if we home does it. Okay, it doesn't really. Oh, it does change the zoom level. It just hitched for a second. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, zooming out gives you an overview of all realms. Zoomed in, you have the ability to select and to manage your holdings. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> There's a fair amount of information on the UI right now. Crusader Kings 3 spans hundreds of years and many generations. So one of the core ideas of this game, this much at least I know, is that you're not playing as a character. You're playing, like, as a bloodline. So if our dude dies, con our control will pass to the dominant heir, I think. Right now, time is standing still because the game is paused. That's a good idea, because I read real slow. Sometimes you will see blue highlighted text. This means you can hover your cursor over the words to display an informative tooltip. Neat. Some of these tooltips may also have highlighted words, which can also be tooltipped for further information. For example, duchy, if we... If we just how do I okay there we go all right that's a little that's a little inconsistent duchy can lead to county which itself can lead to barony except sometimes the tooltips don't uh oh ha, by tool by default it takes a couple of seconds for a tooltip to lock in for mouse overs I wonder why that is the default behavior all right to continue place your cursor over this highlighted text and then okay there's a visible little border effect when it locks in like that okay we're good, I got it. Now let's talk about the game here, four minutes into the video. Everything takes place on the map before you. The world consists of large and small territories, land and titles held by various rulers. Titles are represented by an elaborate coat of arms. Yeah, okay, I think that that verifies. Uh, the icon representing your realm is that of your primary title, the most important and prestigious title you hold. If you hover over your character portrait, the coat of arms over your realm capital will glow, and the entirety of your realm will be highlighted. Munster is your primary title, which is why your realm is named after it. You also hold the Earldom of Thomond as a separate title. 
If you zoom out, it will read monster on this part of the map because you are the top ruler of this area. Indeed. Okay. So, monster is my primary title. Is Mon monster... Okay, monster is the name of my, my kingdom here, which is comprised of Thumond and Ormond. As a ruler, you can only hold so much land on your own. You will often have other rulers helping with the administration of the realm by holding land within your borders, making them your vassals. I'm loosely familiar with this concept. To find your own land, your domain, press home and zoom in. Once closer up, you can see the blue labels on the baronies that belong to you. Okay. The Earldom of Ormond is held by your vassal. This this little dude, Earl Ragenvald. I'm going to... I'm going to do a bad job with a lot of the names. I'll just warn y'all in advance here. Uh, you play one of many characters in this world represented by character avatars. Your character is a, the ruler of a realm. That's true. Uh, you'll need to make sure that your dynasty survives and thrives throughout the ages. Your titles give you power and control over territory as well as over other characters. So characters have skills. Okay. Okay. Diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, and learning, and we're awful at... Okay, we're not awful at everything. We're awful at most things. Real good at... Is this, like, personal? This has got to be, like, leadership, army leadership stuff, not personal combat ability, right? It looks like. Uh, remember, since the above text is highlighted, you can mouse over each skill for a breakdown of what it entails. Yeah, leading armies in battle. I wonder if I'm allowed to just, like, to just duel people? Corresponding lifestyle? Okay, so there, there's a whole concept here that we don't know anything about. Alright, we're not going to get lost in all the... It, we're not going to get lost in cascading tooltips just yet. Characters also have traits, which can affect their skills as well as how they react to things. Some traits tell you about a character's personality, while other traits are specific to how a character has lived their life such as an education trait or commander traits. You are temperate and wrathful and impatient. Wait, temperate in what sense? Okay, temperate in the sense of, yeah, okay, moderation. I was just going to say, I would not, I would have a hard time describing one person as both temperate and impatient, but I guess there's a lot of ways you can apply those words, huh? From this, you can see that your character typically leads a modest life and expects others to do the same and is quick to anger when they don't. When a character chooses to behave contrary to their personal traits, it can cause them stress. Mechanical incentive for role-playing. Traits, uh, traits can also impact how other characters react to you. Some people are impressed by a brave trait, while a lustful character is more likely to feature in salacious gossip. Uh, traits influence other characters' morality and greed, which can both affect their... Uh, which can affect both their hostile and friendly actions. Okay. All characters have an opinion of one another, which drives their behavior. Low opinion can cause people to rise up against you. High opinion can make characters more inclined to join your murder scheme or fall for your seduction. I'm into murder schemes. I do love a secret scheme based on intrigue. Okay, so this is my this is my my son. He's <laughs> he's a lackey, but he's a bold lackey. The word lackey is here probably not used in a judgmental way. To further your goals, you will need gold. Boy, ain't that the truth. Among other things, gold pays for buildings, armies, and bribes. Gold is collected passively from both your holdings and your vassals as tax. Large vassals, more important holdings, tend to give more tax. However, money can't buy everything. Certain things can only be achieved by spending the right amount of prestige or piety. So that's these, I'm assuming. And also we have renown. I am currently insignificant. Your prestige tells you how respected you are. It can be earned passively over time by holding many titles, or actively, such as by marrying into prestigious dynasties or fighting as an ally in wars. It really worries me the number of words that need tooltips. Because, like, I would have thought, you know, ally could just be an English word, right? But no, it has to have a multiple paragraph definition that has eight to ten other blue words in it and... It's going to be a minute here before we know what we're doing. Whenever you earn prestige, you build toward your next level of fame. Higher levels of fame make other characters think better of you and bring powerful ways to wage war. Okay, so do... do yes, fame and piety both have levels in addition to the level that we saw on Renown. 
Some action, actions cost prestige, like declaring war. Uh, spending prestige does not affect your level of fame progress. Okay, so level of fame is lifetime accrued prestige. With a lot of piety, you'll have an easier time interacting with your head of faith. As you are Catholic, this is the Pope. Piety can be lear uh, gained passively from the learning skill and virtuous traits, or actively from pious actions, such as going on a pilgrimage. You also have a level of devotion, which I assume works approximately the same way uh, as the fame thing. Uh, some actions require you to spend piety, like declaring holy wars or creating a new faith, which is a thing I am I am maybe interested in doing. Well, we'll get into that system eventually, I'm sure. As well as traits, your character can also pick a lifestyle. Lifestyles represent what you put the most effort into day to day, and each one has several focuses inside relating to it. Focuses. Okay. Well, it looks like we're about to do it, so I guess we'll, we'll dig into that here. Uh, click on any lifestyle to see its focuses. As time goes by, your character will earn lifestyle experience. When you acquire enough, you can select any of that lifestyle's perks from any of its trees. Perks represent you practicing and developing yourself over time and offer unique bonuses or unlock lifestyle-specific mechanics, such as the ability to start abduction schemes. Oh, interesting. Well, I feel like our dude probably wants to live a martial lifestyle, right? And I know that um, our early game here is going to be all about uniting all of the tiny, the tiny titles in this area, which I think we'll probably do with some amount of military stuff. I, this, this makes sense to me. Oh, there's like a whole thing here. Okay, so strategy focus would give us Marshall plus three. Our Marshall level is already ranked as excellent, so I don't know if I don't know if this is going to be necessary. An authority focus gives us only plus one, but we get more dread. A measure of how feared we are. We could become we could become very scary. We could become a tyrant. Or chivalry. Chivalry will give us prowess. Okay, this is your personal fighting skill. Uh, and also attraction opinion. Uh, you know, ladies love a chivalrous man, I guess. And also battle advantage. Interesting. I wonder... So battles often start with one side having a higher advantage based on terrain and the martial skill and commander traits. Okay, so martial skill also gives advantage. I was going to say, I wonder if five points of advantage works out to be better than three points of martial skill in terms of making your army do more damage. This is a thing that we probably will not know for some time. I'm going to go chivalry focus, because I like the idea of being personally good at combat. No idea if that's a good mechanical play. Uh, and then our, our gallant thing over here is glowing. Can I? Yes. Thank you for making these movable. Oh, no, it wasn't our gallant thing that's glowing. It was this that's glowing. Okay, there's a lot of perk points here. We're not going to bother reading any of these perks yet. Now, having selected a focus, we can move on to other people. Interacting with other characters is key in Crusader Kings 3, and you have many options for how to do so. My impression is that that's most of the game. So you can right-click on a character portrait, including your own, to get a list of potential interactions, such as arranging a marriage or initiating a scheme. This is also where you start wars. That's a, sort of a later problem. So open your character view, right-click the player's heir. Let's start with the basics. Everybody likes gold. Yeah, that's why I want to keep mine. Fine, we'll bribe my child. Send gift. So, hold on. If we pay 50 gold to him, he'll get some opinion and it will decay over time. <laughs> he is likely to accept your gold. Fine. You've successfully increased somebody's opinion of you. Note the feed message in the lower right. Ah, yes, okay. This is where mildly interesting but non-critical information appears and goes away after a little while when unpaused. Certain opinion modifiers last forever, like family bonds, but most will fade over time. If you hover your cursor over the opinion number on another character, you can see exactly where the numbers are coming from. Okay, this all this all makes sense to personal diplomacy. Oh, right, my, my diplomacy rating is garbage. I am bad at dealing with people. Okay, I get it. I get that. 
Let's talk about your dynasty. As the game goes on, unless your character meets with an untimely accident or terrible disease, they will grow old and eventually die. And listen, if any if any terrible accidents are going to happen to us, I bet it's going to be at Brian's hand. The story doesn't end there, though. It's only game over if you do not have an heir. As long as your titles have heirs of your dynasty, your legacy will live on. When your current character dies, you'll simply start playing your player heir. Depending on the type of succession your realm has, this is likely to be one of your children. Perhaps one that you have groomed to rule. Why does rule have a tool to... Okay. I was going to say, that seems like a pretty straightforward concept. Uh, your dynasty has its own coat of arms, which is currently highlighted and could be clicked for more information. I do want to take a quick look at... Okay, the screen does not have as much information on it as I thought it might. Oh, there's actually a nice little um, nice little progress indicator for when the tooltip is going to lock in. That's handy. There's a lot of good UI stuff going on here. This is like a, a big part of this. What's intimidating about this game is the UI, is my understanding. And so far, I'm very pleased with how clear everything is. Succession laws determine how all titles and resources are divided between heirs when a character dies. You currently only have one heir, but okay, fine, let's take a look. Uh, so, open the realm view on the right side of the screen. Aha. Uh -huh. There have to be even more little bars. And inspect the succession tab. As a member of a dynasty, you also have renown. Shared by everyone in your dynasty, renown grows in several ways and reflects how infamous or famous your dynasty is, not your character. Increasing renown will echo down the generations for your descendants, increasing your level of splendor. As the dynasty head, renown will allow you to unlock dynasty legacies that will benefit all of your kin. Okay. To view the dynasty legacy of a dynasty, click on their coat of arms. Is that a thing I can do? I mean, we just did this, right? It's going to open a thing that I don't have any idea what to do with. Yeah, let's, let's not worry about it right now. To ensure the future of your dynasty, you need family members. Getting married is a good start, but we cannot promise that you will marry for love. You know, I'll, I'll get over it. For unmarried characters in your domain, you can set up marriages or betrothals by right-clicking on a character and choosing Find Spouse or Arrange Marriage. The two options behave differently, so sure, let's do them both. Why not? Let's find a spouse. I would love to find a spouse. Alright, we have a list of potential spouses hailing from courts all over the world. Choosing arranged marriage will also open a list of potential spouses, but only with people from the court of the character you clicked. Right, because they're the only ones who have the authority to force a marriage. Your own character is visible on the left because this marriage needs your approval. Whoever is the liege of the other spouse will appear on the right, as the union will need their approval as well. Okay. So arranged marriage can be useful for matchmaking between your courtiers or for setting up specific marriage alliances. Right now, we're just trying to find somebody who can stand being around me. There are many factors to consider when choosing a spouse. To help you out, there's a filter function available to pare down the list of candidates. Uh, aspects to consider include potential alliances, skills, traits, fertility, etc. There's a lot of numbers involved. Also, some traits are congenital, meaning they might be inherited by your children. Perhaps someone with a trait like that is a good place to start. So you can change selection by clicking the Clear Characters button in between the characters you are setting up. Nothing will happen until you press the Send Proposal button. So, okay. I presume they're going to ask me to look for a specific thing here. When you have selected two characters, you are presented with the details of the union along with additional options such as having the marriage be matrilineal. Okay, so usually a thing will, an offer will take a couple days, they'll make it instant, so I just, they're just having me, having me go at it, huh? So, are we currently, how are we currently sorted? Relevance. Boy, that feels like a vague answer to me. What is this? You're deceitful, you're callous... But you're brave. Okay, so she, she's also personally a good fighter. Plus 100% likelihood of dying in battle. I, this is probably not going to be a problem. I don't think I'm going to be sending my wife into battle. Um, Boy, I have no idea how to pick one. I was kind of, um, I was kind of hoping that there was going to be a possesses uh, hereditary skills. That we could just like pick one who has something to pass on. Uh, sadistic, not a great quality in a partner. Well, 
you know, I guess depending on what you're looking for. Listen, I'm not I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum. Craven and fickle and arbitrary. I mean, also her stats probably matter, right? Like I don't know exactly how her stats will affect things, but I imagine having a partner who is good at things you are bad at is probably helpful. So maybe maybe you're not bad cuz you're real good at learning. Ooh, wait, you have good stats. You have, like, really good stats. What's your deal? You're lustful? I mean, we are talking about marrying for the purpose of producing children, right? Also sadistic. A lot of sadistic people in my court. And arrogant on top of it. But her stats are good. I mean, I think, I think she's the winner at the moment here. Okay, we have some other people with some impressive stats. What about you? You are also temperate, okay, <laughs> and also sadistic. There's a lot of that going around. Yo, check out Anor with 20 military skill. Maybe we don't need to have our, our spouse fill in our weaknesses. Maybe we just become the most powerful military couple in the world and solve all of our problems in that way. You know, though, I guess if we're trying to pick up uh, somebody who can really fill in our gaps... The diplomacy gap is probably the greatest, right? I'm comically horrible at diplomacy, and we probably want to be able to do that at least a little bit. So I think... I'm just real quick here looking at all the diplomacy numbers. This lady has a 14. Are her, are her stats terrible? She's ambitious. That's probably a good thing if we're trying to marry her, given that we're the king and everything. And gregarious... A little paranoid, but you know, that can be an upside. Alright, congratulations. You are chosen. Chance of children? Medium. Okay, I mean, I'll take it. Uh, I do not want the marriage to be matrilineal, because, you know, we want children born into our house. And what is a hook? General term for a relationship between characters where one can get the other to do their will. Oh. I think, you know what, I'm just gonna take... Uh, we'll just do it this way. That sounds like some grim shit right there. Okay. I gladly accept your marriage proposal. You'll be joined with my uh, daughter Constance in holy matrimony. I don't love that it was her father who said yes instead of her, but you know, it was a different time. Okay, cool. Excellent. You may have noticed the toast message at the top of the screen. Toast messages deliver quickfire information that is relevant to you or your character. Marriages are also usually accompanied by an event as your potential spouse's liege accepts or rejects your offer with a letter. There are different kinds of events and they are critical to shaping your destiny. I do care quite a bit about my destiny. Uh, maybe also find spouse for your son. Okay, sure. Sure, let's all just, let's all just get married as a family. Uh, so what are your stats, kid? Like, what if we tried to, tried to fill in, can I, okay, here we go, great. Alright, our son is very bad at learning. Also, kind of not great at a lot of other stuff. Better than I am at diplomacy, at least. So I have no idea how to match our son well. Um, I, let's just find him somebody who's age-appropriate, I guess. What is this? You have, a, you have a 15 in intrigue. Okay, that's, I mean, that's a good thing, right? Having some intrigue. What's this one? Stewardship? Which is like, uh... It's going to affect the, the, uh, uh... What, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the money generation of their territory, probably, right? Stewardship is like being good at paperwork. You know, I kind of like the person who's close to him in age and also really good at treasury. Obviously, there, <laughs> there could be some downsides from that, I guess. Humble and vengeful and callous. Good enough for me. That's what I've decided. Alright, we've formed an alliance out of it, in fact. Uh, your son and heir and my daughter will be joined in holy matrimony. Yeah, people like, people like marrying an heir. That's a big deal. Okay. You start producing members of your family. That's... That's a good way to word that. Family's important, you know. The player heir will always come from your dynasty and most often from your house. In the future, it won't hurt to keep an eye on your family and their line of succession. Depending on the succession laws, you might end up inheriting titles, along with land and vassals, from your relatives. 
but not everyone in your dynasty will be landowners. Uh, sometimes every plot of land, every plot of land on the map does have an owner. Sometimes that owner is you. Sometimes it's one of your vassals, and sometimes it's another realm entirely. Many of whom also have or are vassals. Yeah, it's it's complicated. Most titles belong in a pyramid-like hierarchy, according to their title tier. So there are counties and duchies and kingdoms and empires. Every title is legally, technically, but sometimes not in practice, subordinate to a title one tier up the chain. Every county is thus part of a duchy, every duchy is part of a kingdom, and every kingdom is support subordinate to an empire if these higher ranked titles are held by someone with enough clout to enforce order. And there are many dynamic names for these titles. Your current ruler is in charge of a petty kingdom, which feels very judgmental, uh, which is actually a duchy. There are also barons, you have one, they're ruler, uh, rulers of single holdings subordinate to counts. Barony tier characters are generally of minor importance and are not playable. Ooh, okay, we say legally because, as Crusader Kings 3 lets you play with history, there is no way to guarantee that a king is actually in control of all of the titles that his kingdom is supposed to contain within its borders. We call this title hierarchy de jour. And if the structure has been broken, it is often possible to declare war over errant territories. <clears throat> Most titles are considered part of a higher tier title de jure. For example, a ruler may be king of England, but their realm does not yet contain all the lands that are legally considered to be part of England. The holder of a duchy, kingdom, or empire always has a casus belli to seize control of its de jure constituent titles. Okay, so if you were like, the if you were trying to be the king of England but somebody else had taken over, you know, whatever county London is in. Forgive me for my lack of geographical in addition to historical knowledge. You would, you would automatically have cause to declare war to try to take that over. Vassals will also decide who their rightful liege is based on what title their primary title is de jure a part of. Simple, right? This is easy. If you switch to the Duchy Titles map mode, you can see that, as the ruler of the Duchy of Munster, the County of Desmond should legally be part of your realm. Is there a button for that? Change the Duchy Titles map mode. Okay, down here. So is this my is this my map modes? Okay, cool. So, uh... Yes, this is what Munster's supposed to look like. For some reason, it doesn't. Well, that's unacceptable to me. And actually, yeah, okay. So this county of Desmond is made up of a bunch of little baronies. There's four little baronies here. Man, there's a lot of stuff. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. We'll get it. The de jure title of Munster consists of three counties. Their names should be visible on the map, of course. Thalmond, held by you. Desmond, held by a neighboring ruler. And Ormond, held by your vassal. These counties are made up of smaller pieces of land, the baronies. Holdings provide different levels of taxes and levies, as well as buildings that you can construct and upgrade depending on the holy holding type. We suggest you start by upgrading the bastions and curtain walls. Okay, that makes sense. I think we're about to be at war in the very near future. So select bastions and curtain walls among its buildings. Did I... Ah, okay, don't click on the flag, click on the name of the place. Ah, uh, here we go. Select this and hit upgrade. I'm, I'm sure I'm clicking on it. It feels like that ought to... Feels like that ought to do the thing. Hmm. So we can construct... Oh, I'm... Yeah, somehow I had selected the wrong place. Okay, uh... Bastions and Curtain Walls. Here we go. It will take three years to upgrade this? Well... I mean, it says do it. Yeah, wow, that's... Okay, that's gonna be a bit. Uh, feel free to close this thing now, yes. Once construction is completed, you receive the benefits of the building or upgrade that you chose. Every holding provides taxes. If that holder is a vassal, they will in turn pay taxes to their liege. Taxes are your sor main source of gold. Obligations can affect how high or low these taxes are, and being at war can affect... Okay. 
As a ruler, you are likely to be the liege of at least one vassal. These are rulers who have sworn fealty to you and are thus part of your realm. Vassals supply you with gold and soldiers, which is important. It is possible to be both a liege and a vassal at once, and I think most lieges uh, probably are. Let's open up the realm view and let's have a look at our vassals tab. Let's really inspect this good. Here's a list of your current vassals. At the top of the list is the ruler of Ormond, whose land you can see on the map. This is an earldom inside your realm. And an earldom is a kind of county, because we have to have multiple names for things, otherwise people might understand what's going on. So we can come here for an overview of things, such as your vassal's current opinion of you, whether they are considered a powerful vassal, and the levels of taxes and levies. You need to pay careful attention to your powerful vassals, because they expect to hold a seat on your council. Okay. So our dude's not, like, overly fond of us. Plus six seems uh, bad, right? We know that it go we know that it goes up to at least a hundred, so... Uh, we also have a mayor. My spy master. Mayor Fisnecta, maybe? Of this, this little barony over here. Okay, so this is bad. I seem to not be well liked by the people who are important in my kingdom. It's worthwhile keeping your vassals happy. This keeps them out of schemes and factions against you. No matter how mighty a ruler your character is, if your realm unites against you, either to depose you through war or just to murder you while you sleep, your reign is bound to be cut short. Some of your vassals might serve on your council, making their opinion extra important. Yeah. Is there a button for my council? Something probably. Hold on. We'll, we'll get there. There is a limit to how many vassals you can comfortably be in charge of before your realm becomes unwieldy. We are not close to it. Going beyond this vassal limit affects taxes and levies. Doesn't matter for the tutorial. But when you start to build your own kingdom, be mindful of growing too fast. If you end up exceeding your vassal limit, you can grant lower tiered titles. Sometimes you can even create new high tier titles to consolidate your power in a region and strengthen your hold over the lower titles du jour subservient to your new title. I'm going to pretend that I understand. Your realm is the complete body of land and titles that you control, including the areas held by your vassals. Uh, right now, for you, this means, yeah, this area. When domain is used, we are instead referring to the land that you own personally. Just your stuff, not your vassals. Some things that happen only affect your domain, while other things will impact your entire realm. There's a limit to how much land you can hold personally before you start incurring penalties. When you go above your domain limit, yeah, you want to dole land out to your vassals. You can only manage so much stuff yourself. Okay. Managing a realm is a lot of work. Yeah, it sounds like it. As a ruler, you have the help of your council. These can be vassal members of your court... Uh, and they act as your trusted advisors. There is a council position according to, or corresponding to each skill, and married rulers will also have their spouse assisting them. Good. Good, I need it. Counselors can be set to work, and they all do different things. You can change a counselor's task by clicking on the button near their portrait in the council view. Being a counselor is a prestigious position. Powerful va vassals expect to be appointed and will be unhappy if they are left out. Okay, so we got... Uh, close the window on me. That's fine, we'll look at it later. <laughs> Schemes are long-term goals aimed at another character. They can have hostile goals like murder or abduction. We're hearing a lot about that. Or be more wholesome, uh, wholesome such as the befriend scheme. This is a terrifyingly inhuman way to describe the act of becoming someone's friend. Alright, let's look at this schemes tab. A good time to use a scheme might be when you find the line of succession to not be as clear-cut and favorable as you'd like. One way to get ahead is simply to remove the competition. You know, quietly, and with no witnesses. Obviously, if you get caught trying to put together a murder scheme, there will be consequences. The Sway scheme is made for increasing the opinion someone has of your character. Let's try it. Yeah, I think I probably should. Alright, so right-click on your court chaplain and choose Sway. So, yeah, I need... I need to make you like me better. Can I see? Hold on a second. Let me... Oh, he's only plus one on us. Everybody in our council... Okay. We are not well liked. 
Uh, if the scheme is successful, his opinion of us will increase considerably, but there is only a 64% chance of that, and it's gonna take forever! Oh my god. Alright, it's fine. Once set in motion, your scheme will slowly progress over time. The time before a conclusion is reached varies based on the scheme's success chance, which can be affected by relevant skills. If you are unhappy with your scheme, you can always abandon it. Alright, so let's open up the Intrigue view and have a look at our, our scheme here. So this is the this is the burn the scheme button. We're here we see a progress meter. Okay. Sometimes schemes can give rise to secrets. If you catch someone trying to commit murder, it's probably in their best interest to make sure you keep it quiet. Ah, this is where the blackmail comes in. Hooks represent a favor you can call in or a hold you have over, over a particular character, letting you encourage or force them to do your bidding. As you play, you'll find many different ways to gain and use hooks. Okay, let's pretend you've managed to get a hook on one of your vassals. Yes, let's. This weak hook can be used for a number of things. For example, you can increase the obligations set by the feudal contract you have with a feudal vassal. To access the menu for changing your feudal contract, go to your vassal list in the realm view, or right-click his portrait and choose modify feudal, con uh, feudal contracts. So this is our vassal here, the dude in Ormond. I would like to modify this contract, which I can do because I got this hook. You may notice that some interactions are not immediately visible. You have many interactions available, okay, in case you needed more options. Right. War is an essential part of Crusader Kings 3. There are many concepts to cover, but for now, let's touch briefly on some of them. This is sounding very familiar to me. The most important events in any war are the battles. That makes sense. Uh, most of your soldiers will come from levies, but you can expand your army by employing men-at-arms. If things get really tough, you can also hire mercenaries. You know, if you're not broke. When a war starts, you can raise your armies with a single click of the big red Raise Armies button. Hey, that's helpful. Uh, that will appear together with the War Score icon to the lower right of your screen. You can, of course, raise all armies from this military view as well. When a war is over, you have to disband your soldiers before starting another war. Okay, so it's not like we just have an army. We have armies for specific purposes, really. Rally points are mustering grounds. Uh, this is where they will appear when called to war. So, okay, this is all of our levies. We also have six knights, which is... Where does that come from? Okay, of course, more... St you know what? It'll tell me if we need to know this. Uh, to start a war, you'll need a legitimate reason, a casus belli. There are various ways to obtain a casus belli. You might have de jure titles that make you the rightful liege of your target, you might inherit claims, or you could pursue holy wars against nearby infidels. You know, for whatever your personal definition of infidel is. Although these are the most common, there are dozens of different types of casus belli for you to discover and use as you play. The easiest and most straightforward way to acquire claims is to use Fabricate Claim on County. This is something your court chaplain sees to through one of his counselor tasks. Okay, come up with a legal reason for me to declare a war, please. <laughs> Soon we'll let you unpause the game, just you wait. Just a few things to go over first. Firstly, it's important to know that there are five different speeds available for you to play at, and you'll be able to pause or change pace whenever you want. Secondly, for certain important events, the game will auto-pause for you. There's nothing wrong with playing at lower speeds. Uh, generally, we recommend you pause the game when inspecting menus or when you are faced with a tough decision. Yeah, I think that's probably going to happen a bunch. To start the ticking of time, unpause the game. This will let days, months, and years go by, armies instructed to march will move, events will occur, letters will be sent, and characters will age. Okay. As a first task, let's remind your neighbor, the Earl of Desmond, who his rightful liege truly is. Use the character interaction system, select him via the map, and declare war on the ruler of Desmond. Okay, well that feels a little, a little harsh. Uh, we have a valid cast of spell eye because Desmond is supposed to be my land. Okay. So, uh, wait, let that click in all the way. Okay, this dude. Declare war on this dude. So this will 
Okay, this will bring us to a screen where we have all of our Cassis Belli available. Uh, Cassi Belli, I guess, because that would be the... Uh, whatever. We we currently have a Cassis Belli. Yeah, okay, do it. I, I Everybody agrees it is sensible for me to seize the kingdom of the Earl of Desmond. He is vastly inferior to my military. He only has a mere five knights. Can you imagine the embarrassment? All right, I done declared war. We probably ought to rally the armies. That seems like a good idea. Uh, you could also do this from the military view. You know, I think I'll do it right here. That's fine. Okay, so we're gathering. We got two days left. You have to unpause the game for your army to gather more than a handful of men. Leave it for a few days and the army will be at full strength. Okay, I'm going to put it in. I'm going to unpause here. How quick? Okay, really quickly, actually. Days go by real fast. Uh, to move your army, yeah, right-click. Perhaps the enemy capital barony. Hey, that seems like a good idea. Go forth, men, and and slay them with violence. Now the army is moving, it is probably heading into battle with enemy forces. Uh-oh, stuff's happening. Hold on. Battles will happen automatically if two armies cross paths. Similarly, sieges occur when you place your army on an enemy holding. This is a good time to unpause the game, unless some wild shit's happening with your wedding. In which case, deal with that, probably. Uh, with my marriage to Petty Queen Constance, the realm expects us to throw a suitably extravagant wedding celebration. It is well within my right to collect a royal aid duty as part of this, but some may consider it tasteless to levy an extra tax during a time of jubilation. Listen, I would be more jubilant if I had some extra taxes coming in. Uh, so if we did this, we'd get some money, but if we did this, everybody would, would really dig that. I will let my subjects enjoy the festivities without worry or care. We're fine on money for the moment. I think. I assume that the numbers we're looking at here are good. Okay. Um, so your dudes don't really move in real time. It just it takes them a while and they just pop over there. The outcome of a battle between two armies depends on a number of things. The number of levies both sides have, which, if any, men-at-arms either side is using, the commanders involved, and even the terrain you're fighting in. Click on your fighting army to open the combat view. Or is this... This is already the combat view. Yeah, it's open already. Okay. So how's this all going? I mean, there's no men-at-arms. I got more knights than they do. We got way more men than they do. If I just unpause this, we're going to totally kick their asses, right? One assumes. Yeah, it's going... It's going... Actually, we're kind of... We're, we're bleeding dudes at a remarkable pace, though. Alright, our knight did a thing. Our army is attacking a holding. Click the highlighted icon, the spearheads, to... The spearheads? Oh, I see. It's sort of ca camouflage below that. You need to win si sieges to win wars, generally, as they increase your war score. Whenever a siege is won, the area will become occupied, changing its regular look on the map from a solid color to striped colors when zoomed out. Tell me a little about war score. Okay, it's just a... It's a very simple, abstract measure of, of, of war winningness. At 100 war score, you can force the other side to accept a peace offer. Okay, where do I... Where do I see the war score for my current war? Oh, they're about to tell me. You can always go look at the war score in the lower right corner. It goes from negative 100 to positive 100. Ours is at... 32. See, here it's expressed as a percent, which is weird. I guess, I guess it is a percent, right? Because it's out of 100. But it's strange that it's not expressed as a percentage in any of these other boxes. Okay. All wars end in one of three ways. Victory, white peace, or defeat. And the exact consequences of these change depending on your Cassus Belli. Details for a specific war can be found by right-clicking your enemy ruler and selecting Offer Peace, or by clicking the War Score icon in the bottom right and then selecting one of the tabs. Ah, okay. So, obviously, if we were to enforce demands, we would take control of the county, because that's that's what we went to war about. This dude would become my vassal. I would gain some fame. My allies would probably gain some fame. We don't have any allies. Um, does my does my vassal count as an... I, how's the word ally used here? Whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're obviously we're going for this. We'll get there eventually. 
I mean, we're about to take over his whole his whole deal, right? He can't defend against this, presumably. I'm trying to. There we go. So we're making one point of siege progress per day. Every 20 days, a new siege event will occur. The besieging army is taking five casualties every month from attrition. But how are we doing against? Okay, so they're, I don't know what this is. Their morale, maybe? They have supplies. We're not going to starve them out. They have functional walls. I guess, yeah, let's just unpause it and see how it's going. Alright, so his army's all busted up, but they are getting away. Oh, it looks like they've reformed and they're just going to come right back over here, huh? Uh-oh. Sickness is spreading. Is that, sorry, is that sickness within the city or in my army? Once again, we're totally kicking their asses, but again, we are we are bleeding dudes. Okay, so these are just my battle notifications. So yeah, the war score, it's going well. Score capped to plus 50%. Hold up. Why score capped to plus 50%? Is it because we haven't taken any land from them yet? Oh, this is uh, this is uh, score from battles won is capped. Yeah, and then there's objectives and stuff to consider. Okay, you cannot win a war entirely by fighting battles in the field. That makes sense to me. You know, you got to get on the point. What is the okay routed casualties? It's a little white flag. Uh, well, their army has basically been completely annihilated at this point. Are we still sieging? No siege event will occur. Ah, the besieging army is smaller than the garrison. That seems like a problem. How do I... I need to raise more levies? So this is the enemy army... Yeah, we got, we got beat up enough. We bled enough dudes that now we need more people. So how to get more people? Uh, they said I could hire mercenaries and stuff. But they didn't tell me how. Let's, um... Real quick here. I'm assuming... He's still not willing to. Yeah, we gotta we gotta get that get that war score just a little bit higher. All right, so yeah, we are going to need men to do that. Then is my understanding. But we've already levied all the levies we're entitled to. So, uh, military. Wow, that's a lot of dudes. So there's a bunch of a bunch of different war bands available. We'll all have their various prices. It feels like we don't need a lot of help here. 110 wealth for a three-year contract. I mean, it's not a small amount of money, I guess, but... This... This seems valuable, right? So if I hire these guys, where... I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm going to press this button, and we're just going to find out. Do they appear... I assume they don't appear instantly, right? They have to show up. No, they, they totally did. They got here instantly. Well, fellas, if you could just come over here and help out with this, that would be lovely. Because apparently I just didn't I just didn't do the math on this siege in a very smart way. You guys just, just hold out. There we go. Now we got some siege happening. Look at that, we're making 1.1 .1 progress per day. And in the meantime, just kind of don't worry about what's going on in the rest of the world, I guess. Oh, hey, that bailey was constructed. We did it. We have defenses. It's probably a good thing. Uh, I guess let's pause for a second here and have a quick look at our... Uh, no, I want to look at my thing. Yeah, here we go. Should we be doing other buildings? Probably, right? Uh, oh boy. 
Okay, so we can construct some military academies. Lowers the gold maintenance cost of our army, gets us more knights, and makes our knights better. If we build some marches, we get better levy reinforcements. Unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is going to be just like blind choices because we do not yet understand the significance of, say, knights in combat. I don't know how important it is to have more knights. It seems important. But so does a lot of this other stuff. Dedicated siege works allow the ruler to field and maintain superior quality siege weapons. That does seem like a good idea, right? If, if winning sieges is super important, and we're clearly not doing an amazing job at it at the moment, we can afford this. Let's... Let's get some other improvements going. Let's not just sit on our hands while we wait for the siege to complete, right? Uh, and then... Have a quick look at our council. How's everybody doing? Our bishop is still not really in love with us. Sorry, he's... He's evil? We just have a guy... Like, we know he's evil? Okay, fine. You know, who am I to judge? That guy's a rational absolver. This guy's a covetous adventurer. Organized levies. Hmm. So this gives a bonus to our levy size. I wonder if we... How does this work exactly? Is this a thing we could press now and it would give us extra men? Or is it a thing we would have had to have pressed prior to calling up the levies? I don't know. And I also don't know how to know. Our Earl is terrified due to our dreadful rep reputation. Here, you know what? Let's, um... Let's try to sway this dude, too. Is there a cost to running multiple schemes at a time? Like... Okay, no, I, I can only have one personal scheme running at a time. That's the, that's the cost. So they are exclusive. All right, well, then I guess let's just uh, let this siege run its course, right? We're doing stuff. We're working. I click on this, can I get more information? No, not really. Okay. Our wife is burying our child. That's a good thing. That was one of our goals. We're really checking things off the old action item list here. I will say it creeps me out a little bit that we had a big list with the word impregnate on it in capital letters, but at least we got it done, you know? Okay. These people are having a miserable time. Disease is rampant within the city... Their supplies are running low. I feel like they should just yield already. Don't you don't you think that sounds like a good idea? Alright, there we go. We, we now possess 100% of the enemy's holdings, which is probably going to affect the old war score a bit, eh? Alright, you are now able to enforce your demands by clicking the war score icon to open the thing. Yeah, let's do that. Enforce demands. <laughs> Congratulations on your very easy victory. You have now experienced what it is like to make it through an essential part of the game. The tutorial lessons end here. However, pieces of advice will still occasionally appear as alert icons. Good, because I'm going to need them. And by the way, y'all, feel free to offer advice in the comments below as well. This is obviously going to be a little bit of a learning experience. It's going to take some time, but we'll get there. We always get there. Alright, so this dude became a vassal. I imagine he's not going to be, like, a happy vassal. Uh-oh. More stuff. Uh, so be it. There are many things you could do now that you've dipped your toes in some of the essential systems. Crusader Kings 3 is about setting your own goals. If you want a suggestion, we recommend you try to become the king or queen of all Ireland. War is not the only way, either. Or you can click the current situation button up top and see if any of the items under suggestions <laughs> strikes your fancy. The game will offer you some goals if you can't think of one on your own. Uh, so. Let's dismiss these battle notifications. Okay, you're the current situation tab. So we have a powerful vassal who expects a council position. This is the new guy, Earl? Wait, no, uh, sorry. <laughs> His name is not Earl, this is an Earl. Uh, yeah, the dude of Desmond. Well, I'll tell you what, my friend. Uh, the council's currently full. 
And you also I do not trust. You hate me very much on account of the violence that I did to you. So th his declared war negative opinion modifier is increasing in value. I'm assuming that that's, that's like the sign is correct there. It's not telling me that it's increasing in mag magnitude. It's going to go from neg 23 to neg 21 because the war is over and that's going to burn off over time. If we give him a seat on the council, he's still going to be powerfully negative, but I guess maybe he'll get over it eventually. I don't know if short reign is the kind of thing that falls off. That seems like the, the, the kind of thing a man might stay mad about. Uh, you can declare war on some other dudes. You have family members who can get married. You have a hook on your feudal vassal, Earl Ragenvald. Which you can use to modify their contract. We'll worry about that in a second. I guess, let's figure out if we want this guy to do a thing. So if we did want him to do a thing, it would be to become our steward. Right? That's what he's good at. What's your deal? Uh, you are worse at stewardship. Are you important? You're my nephew. I feel like it's okay to kick this, kick the kid off the council. He might have, he might get sore about that, but I also think that it would be worse to keep this dude off. So, how, how do I do that? Um, yeah, I want to appoint a steward. I think we ought to appoint, uh, old Mori here. Yeah, I hope Malachi's not too cross about this. Loses 20 opinion of you for 10 years. Oh, that'll only take him barely negative. It's fine. That's fine. Alright, I do think that's probably good for the long-term stability of the... etc. Uh, you can declare war on... This guy in Ilek. Wait, where is that? We got a lot of things open right now. Uh, here, let's close the council tab for the moment. Oh, all the way up there. Okay, can I... Do I have ships? Do I have ships, or is it going to be cool with everybody in the middle of us if I walk over there? Also, what is my... Okay, so is this... This is a guy that's in my court who we believe has a claim to this land. What's your deal? Who are you? Just some, just some dude in my court. Okay. It's got a familial claim or some, some, some such nonsense. I'm sure there's a good way to like really look at this. He's club-footed. That doesn't really seem relevant, but I guess it's in here. So does he have to be part of like? To what degree is he going to be part of this thing? Are his soldier and like commander traits going to be relevant? Do I need to have him? be the commander. Oh, their military strength is so tiny. They're so tiny and weak. Oh, we should, yeah, we should do this. This seems like a good idea. Also, I got, I got allies in Burgundy and the Auxerre, which is somewhere. Yeah, I mean, Burgundy's in France. I knew that. This is also in France. I guess that makes sense, given the spelling. Where are... They're not going to be able to assist us in that, probably. They would not even get over here by the time that was dealt with. Uh, let's look at our family members. So I have a half-brother, one of my knights. He should probably get married, right? We like it when, when people, when our dudes are married. Because we, we want there to be lots of people in our family in case of, you know, the Middle Ages happening. Uh, okay, well, let's, let's find you, let's find you a, so he has a title claimant, which complicates his opinion on me, but he's still pretty positive. Let's get him married. He'll, he'll love us if we get him married. Uh, you are 47 years old. I know that, like, in, in older eras, it was considered less important that, uh, that people be close in age. And, you know, marriage for the purpose of, like, expanding claims and stuff is certainly of value. Interesting. Intelligence is congenital. 
Well, I mean, that seems pretty good, man. You want intelligent... You want intelligent heirs, right? What's your what's your deal, Inga? You're lazy and sadistic because everybody is, you know? Can use hostile schemes against their own children. Okay, well, that's not awesome. And content. Okay. And honestly, your stats are all right. Yeah, you're getting married. You're, we're doing this. You will definitely accept you love this idea. You are also terrified of me because I'm seen as some kind of monster. I don't believe that this is fair. All right, what about you? My half-brother and one of my knights. Okay, uh, you also need a, need a wife. What do your stats look like? You're good at fighting. That makes sense. Uh, wow. 19, huh? And you're the one who is quick. Does feel like uh, a bit of an age gap, but... Maybe that's a good idea. You're vengeful and paranoid and lustful, but not sadistic. Which really puts you a cut above like 80% of the people on the earth at this point, it seems like. You're also quick and you're good at stewardship and diplomacy. You know, that might be valuable. Ambitious, potentially a little scary. Compassionate, might offset the ambition a little bit. And stubborn, stubborn like a mule. Tegan does not back down for anything. So a lot of factors that are going to make her opinion of me lower. But, you know, she's got the stats and she's got the quickness. She's got a, a good trait to pass down. Obviously, the fact that, uh, that Greta here is 18 uh, means that there will be more time for children. That's probably a thing that matters, right? He will lose renown. Why is that? And will form an alliance with th this person who is her liege. Okay, so <laughs> she is a dishonorable antagonist. Hold on. What if we... Okay, so it is generally the case that he is going to lose some renown because I'm marrying him to people who are, who are less powerful and famous, I assume. Honestly, though, I kind of like... I kind of... This is maybe going to be a little bit of a messy marriage, and I'm... I'm a little leery of bringing even more sadists into the family, but that seems like a, you know, they should be married. They should be producing children, I think. All right, you have fewer men at arms than is expected for a ruler of your rank. Recruiting some will bolster your army, serving both to deter potential enemies as well as combat those who insist on fighting anyway. That does seem important. So how does this work? We don't know anything about men at arms. Hold on, let's let that solidify so we can look at this tooltip. Professional soldiers who are better at fighting. The player has direct control over the composition and size of their men-at-arms regiments. Different types are good or bad in different types of, uh, of terrain, and they counter other types. Yeah, it's like pikes beat cavalry. And... Okay, that makes sense. Hold on, let's close this. We got a lot of, again, we have a lot of UI open right now. So we should probably have some regiments. I'm assuming this is a setup cost, but there's probably also a... Yeah, a maintenance cost. Okay, so... We're thinking about going here. How do I... I don't want to look at you. I want to look at... Let's close this for a moment. I want to look at your territory. Okay, so terrain type is hills. But right, terrain type is, is a barony level thing. So there's, there's forest and hills and wetlands. All right. So were we to raise some men-at-arms, we would want to look for ones who are good in those types of terrain. So forest and taiga and jungle for you guys. Bowmen, yeah, I was going to say bowmen probably like hills, right? They counter skirmishers. We have no idea what kind of army he has, but aside from tiny, we know, we know that it is small. Let's, um... It feels like having bowmen is a good idea. I'm a little concerned that I'm going to end up uh, creating a situation here where I just have too many things. So obviously siege weapons sound like a pretty good idea. And they seem to have pretty low maintenance relative to the other... Uh... Yeah, wow, some of these are, some of these are quite expensive. 
So light footmen don't particularly particularly love these terrain types. Horsemen don't really want to be on hills. I mean, we probably just want... Let's just have, like, some, some foot soldiers and some bows. And maybe, like... I mean, it says two of five. We should probably have five then, right? If we're planning to do a lot of warring in the near future. Two bowmen regiments. Uh, pikes in case of horses. Also, pikes like to fight on hills. We're about to do some hill fighting. And then, uh, boy, what else do you think? Probably some siege stuff, right? So is there any reason to use Onagers over Mangonels aside from the fact that the Mangonels are marginally more expensive? Reinforces to 10. They look pretty... Yeah, I'm going to do this. Okay, so now we're doing that. We're recruiting some, some people. Our army will be even larger and more impressive soon. Uh, we have some prisoners. Clicking on that just closed it. Whatever, it's fine. We don't we don't need it. So, we either need to disband our levies or get them moving right now. Because we're paying a lot of extra money, right? For these for these levies. So this is this is a total of seven soldiers. I feel like it's probably not even really worth combining them in here. How do I how would I even do that? Can I I'm having a hard time selecting this army. Boy, just figuring out the controls. The army is actually here, despite the fact that they are depicted as being there. That's a little weird. Let's see, when I click on them, I do not... Alright, you know what? We'll figure this out. Listen, we're gonna figure it all out. It's just gonna be a little bit of a nightmare for like an episode or two. We're almost, we're almost at the point where we can basically play the game. I think this is probably an okay place to call it for right now. Because I'm going to spend some time just fiddling with the UI here and learning how to run the basic uh, concepts. Uh, the intention here is for there to be a new hour of gameplay every weekday uh, for the foreseeable future. I have no idea exactly how long this is going to run, but it's going to be a long one, probably. Uh, so come back next time, tomorrow, when I have figured out how to move my armies around and also what we're going to do next. And we'll see you then.